Hi, podcast listeners. A previous version of this episode misidentified the voices of David Castillo and Jacobo Atala when describing a recorded telephone exchange between them. That mistake has been corrected. Thanks for listening. This is a cell phone call that was intercepted on May 2nd, 2016. There are two men on this call. One is Jacobo Atala. He's a member of the Atala Zablas, a well-known business family in Honduras. The other person on the line is David Castillo. You'll recall that David is the CEO of DESA. DESA is the hydroelectric company that was planning to build a dam in western Honduras. But then it ran into protests from environmental activist Berta Cáceres. At the time of this call between David and Jacobo, it has been two months since Berta was assassinated in her home. On this morning, David tells Jacobo he has una mala noticia, some bad news. Police have raided the offices of DESA. And that can only mean one thing, that investigators suspect Dessa had something to do with Berta's murder. The police also have arrested one of the company's employees, a manager who'd worked on the dam project. The two men seemed stunned. No puede ser. Um, no puede ser. Thing. It can't be, Jacobo says. Impossible. This call marks the moment when David Castillo's life changes dramatically, when he and his colleagues realize that their company is at the center of the murder investigation. It marks the start of a journey that ends with David in a courtroom, facing charges that he planned Berta's murder. No, 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 no. In the five-plus years since Berta's death, lots of people in Honduras and around the world have urged the country to bring her killers to justice. Seven people have already been sentenced for their roles in the killing. These included the hitmen who pulled the trigger to kill Berta, as well as a few middlemen who helped plan the logistics. But to the Caceres family and their supporters, that wasn't enough. Punishing low-level triggermen is one thing. Going after the powerful accused of paying them to kill is another. And that kind of accountability is extremely rare in Honduras. This trial, in the eyes of many in the international human rights community, is a test of the country itself. When you last heard from us, David was preparing for his day in court. Now, that moment has come. David says he's innocent, that he and Berta were friends. The prosecution says they'll prove he was a manipulative killer. Over the next two episodes, we'll walk you through key moments in the trial of David Castillo, from the opening statements all the way to the final verdict. I'm Monty Real, and this is Blood River. It has taken a long time for David's case to make it to court. Exactly two years after Berta's murder, in 2018, David was detained as a suspect. He was kept in a prison to await trial. But then the case got stuck. Nothing happened. And under Honduran law, if a suspect is held for two and a half years with no trial, the suspect goes free. In August of 2020, the Honduran courts ruled that David would at last face his accusers. Berta's 88-year-old mother broke down in tears at the news. Ha sido una lucha incansable. 
She said it was a tireless fight against the most powerful economic forces in Honduras. To her, it felt like the last five years, all the demonstrations and the protests demanding justice for her daughter were paying off. At that time, the trial seemed imminent. The prosecutors believed it would be scheduled in a few weeks. That's where our previous episode left off. But right after that, David's defense team begins filing numerous appeals. Each one gets kicked to a higher court to be resolved. That takes months. Summer turns to fall. At the same time, the pandemic is wreaking havoc in Honduras. Judges and other court officials are getting sick. The court system is jammed with cases. Fall turns to winter. In January of this year, a long-deferred evidence hearing is called to order. The hearing commences. David's lawyers register a new appeal. The appeal has to go to a higher court, and the higher court shoots it down. This happens week after week. The hearing is called to order and then suspended no fewer than 11 times in the first months of 2021. David's lawyers say this is just due diligence. They say the appeals are against a legal system that's stacked against him. The trial has been assigned to the same branch of the federal courts that already had convicted one of David's employees for his role in the murder. The defense believes the case should be moved to another branch. Their appeals are dismissed, one after another. David himself has always insisted he wants this case to go to trial. He says he had nothing to do with this murder, and he wants to clear his name and regain control of his life. This has been terrible, horrible. It, I've lost everything, everything. Nine months after it was decided David's case would be tried, the judges schedule the actual date. They reserve a courtroom for April 6th. That's the sound of a microphone test inside a federal courtroom in Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras. Three judges take their places at the bench. They look out upon a small room. Teams of prosecutors line one side of the chamber. The defense attorneys face them from the opposite side. In the middle of the floor, between them is the wood-paneled witness box. A rotating cast will take turns inside that box. They'll include police investigators, colleagues of Berta, and colleagues of David. Technical analysts will summarize tens of thousands of pages of telephone records for the judges. The courtroom has been reserved for three weeks, enough time, the judges think, to work through all the evidence and hear all the arguments. But just like everything else in this case, the trial does not finish on schedule. It doesn't end in late April, or May, or June. That's because there's a lot of new evidence. We'll hear secretly recorded phone calls and read previously unreleased text messages. We'll have a clearer view than we've ever had of the events that led up to the murder. It'll all be laid out before the judges. And after five years, a case that has been watched and argued about all over the world will finally be closed. Before we sort out that evidence, I need to explain how a trial like this works in Honduras. It's a little different than the kind you might be familiar with. First of all, it's not a jury trial. The three-judge panel hears the evidence, and they're the ones to decide if David is guilty or not. David is represented by his defense attorneys, and the case against him is argued by prosecutors. But 
there are multiple teams of prosecutors. First, you have the state. These are the federal prosecutors from the Honduran Public Ministry, roughly equivalent to the Justice Department in the United States. But next to them, at separate tables, sit the private prosecutors. These attorneys represent not the state, but the surviving victims of the crime, Berta's family members, in other words. They'll argue their own cases, independent of the federal prosecutors. They'll call their own witnesses to the stand and present their own evidence. They'll take part in questioning and cross-examination of all the witnesses, separate from the public prosecutors. At first blush, this might sound a little like the system in the United States, where the state directs a criminal trial and the families of victims can bring separate civil suits to court. But that's not what this is. The judges in this case won't issue two verdicts, one for the public prosecutors and another for the private team. There'll only be one verdict. It's just that the state and the private prosecutors will have a voice in the courtroom. Joseph Barra is a law professor at UCLA, specializing in human rights law. He's part of an international observer mission monitoring the trial. He says that the private prosecutors might be thought of as a sort of legal insurance policy against corruption. Imagine a case where a public prosecutor might be paid off or influenced by a wealthy, well-connected defendant. A team of private prosecutors might help counter the possibility of a fixed trial. Ideally, their interests should in some ways merge with the public interests in getting to the root of the crime, finding the truth, and achieving justice. And they have a specific kind of moral high ground in wanting to achieve that justice because they are the ones who have been victimized by the crime. Trials like this are required to be open to the public, according to Honduran law. But the law didn't foresee the outbreak of a global pandemic. The judges ruled that only the separate teams of attorneys, as well as one member from Berta's family and one from David's, could watch from inside the courtroom. To satisfy the requirement that the trial be public, the judges made it available via live stream. The audio isn't the best quality. At times, it sounds completely distorted. The camera doesn't show the judges. More often than not, it's pointed at the backs of the public prosecutors. So it's not that great at capturing whatever visual drama might unfold. But when you call up the video, there's a column where observers can type in comments in real time. And instantly, David's family members and sympathizers start to get into sparring matches with Berta's side. As the trial gets underway, someone using an account linked to Copin, Berta's organization, types a comment. May justice be done and may David pay for his crime. The name of David's mother, Denora, appears on screen. You might remember her from previous episodes. She's always been her son's most unwavering defender. Everything will come out. Everything will come out someday. I am more than sure. My faith is, like, unbreakable, and I know that Somehow, somewhere, someone will be able to, to tell the truth about all this and how everything has been manipulated. Denora types her response in the margin. She says God will never allow David to be punished for this crime because he's innocent. Someone snaps back and tells her to leave God out of it. That triggers backlash from other backers of David. One says Berta was a fraud, someone who stoked conflict for personal gain. The running commentary never stops. It appears as a constant scroll, unrolling throughout the trial. And it will only get nastier. Muchas gracias, Susanidia. El Ministerio Público, Susanidia, pues haremos nuestra presentación. It's April 28th. 
two days after the trial was supposed to have ended, but new appeals and complaints by the defense have had to be sorted out and dismissed in turn. Finally, it's time for the opening statements. The public prosecutors go first. They explain that they're going to present hard evidence that will leave no doubt of David's involvement in this killing. He was in communication with some of the people who've already been convicted for taking part in the murder. Their most important witnesses will be the government telephonic investigators who extracted those communications and who've mapped out the connections that, they say, put David at the center of the crime. Next, the private attorneys representing Berta's family have a turn. They'll argue that David's company, Dessa, was essentially a criminal organization. They say it used political and economic connections to harass and terrorize Berta. Finally, it's the defense's turn. They reject everything the prosecutors have implied in their statements. They argue that the Honduran investigators, the same ones that the prosecutors consider their star witnesses, are the ones who need to be brought to justice. The defense says these investigators felt pressure from the victim's family and from the international community to appear as if they were solving this crime. Se cometieron serias irregularidades que lejos... Serious irregularities. David's attorneys say the state's telephone experts manipulated the evidence to implicate David. And in doing so, the investigators ignored other clues, clues that might have led them to the real murderers. The defense strategy is clear from day one. David, they argue, is the victim of a state-sponsored conspiracy. Con la mano en la Constitución, repita después de mí, diga, prometo, prometo decir la verdad, decir la verdad, solo la verdad. Solo la verdad. The next day, the first witnesses for the prosecution are called. A police investigator places his right hand on the Honduran Constitution and swears to tell the truth, only the truth. After him comes a medical examiner and a ballistics expert. Together, they establish the facts of the case that aren't in dispute. On March 2nd, 2016, three men broke into Berta's house at about 11.30 p.m. They shot her dead, and they also shot Gustavo Castro, a Mexican environmentalist who was staying with Berta in a guest bedroom. He survived. In the weeks following the murder, investigators examined data from nearby cell phone towers. They identified a few cell phones that didn't belong to local residents, but were active in Berta's subdivision near the time of the murder. Those suspicious phones had been in contact with individuals connected, directly or indirectly, to David's company, Dessa. Two months after the murder, police arrested the alleged hitmen. That was the same day they also arrested two DESA employees with connections to David. The same day that Jacobo Atala called David with the news. One of the men arrested that day was the former head of security for the dam project that Berta opposed. He was an ex-military officer named Douglas Bustillo. You'll hear Bustillo's name again. That's because the text messages and call logs that were extracted from his cell phone are vital keys to the prosecution's case against David. There are thousands of pages of these communications. During the trial, experts spend days on the stand reading aloud individual messages. Y es que no tenemos un plan de contingencia pasiva. That message, for example, is from a WhatsApp chat group that included David. 
A DESA employee at the time says he has been in contact with people he refers to as, quote, informants. The state prosecutors explain that DESA, for three years, had cultivated paid informants to monitor Berta's movements. This included some people who claimed to be part of Berta's organization. In one message, sent less than a month before the murder, Odessa manager writes to David and the others, saying, quote, She said again that some of their people tell us everything. But she didn't refer to any particular person. She said, David Castillo knows everything when she goes there. The prosecutors want to underscore this idea. David Castillo knows everything. Remember his background. He's a graduate of West Point who returned to Honduras to serve as a military intelligence officer. Berta's friends and family believe that history is deeply significant. They say he's the kind of person you can never take at face value. A spy, someone who tries to get close to people only to get information that he can use to his advantage. And they say he leveraged his military and political contacts against Berta. The prosecutors sift through some of the text messages to illustrate this. They point to one exchange between David and Danielle Atala. Danielle is the CFO of DESA, and he's also a member of the Atala Zabla family, the company's principal investors. David writes, Danny, I need the cash for the afternoon meetings. Witnesses for the prosecution suggest those meetings may have involved politicians. At the time, the president of Honduras was named Pepe Lobo. David writes, The mayor just asked Pepe to resolve Dessa's problem caused by Copine. They just saw him in the Council of Ministers. We have a mayor. Daniel Atala responds, The one from Intibuca went? Yes, David writes. The prosecutors have no proof that any payments were actually made no bank statements or canceled checks or corroborating testimony. And they present no evidence that those politicians actually did them any favors. About 10 days after that exchange, David sends a message asking for cash to take to Intibuca. In court, the expert reads Daniel's response. Remember, he says, there's only 65 because the rest is for the minister. Prosecutors also offer other messages that they say suggest Dessa was paying off lawyers and witnesses to protect itself from legal troubles. In one exchange between David and other Dessa officials, they discuss an incident that threatened to land someone connected to the company in hot water. One of them writes, The woman making the accusation and the supposed witnesses are from Valle de Angeles, and we need to work them in a subtle way. This has to be done through third parties to avoid them saying that there's coercion, threats, extortion, bribes, invalidating the witnesses or the evidence. The message continues. And take care of the bosses, take care of ourselves, and, of course, protect our company. David has maintained that Dessa sometimes appealed to police and other officials for help and that they had every right to do so, because Berta and Copine were waging a violent and completely illegal campaign against it. Last year, from his jail cell, David told me that, of course, he contacted the police and other officials asking for their support. People from Berta's organization had vandalized his worksite, he said, destroying equipment and setting buildings on fire. They had to be stopped. That's what we think is normal. But we are criticized saying that we manipulated or that we uh, influenced the police. You see 100 people going into your site or to your house armed with machetes and with um, Molotov bombs with fire and gasoline and you get scared. And what you do is you call the police and you let them know, these people are invading my property. Please come here, do something, get them out. But these messages being read in court now were new. 
and some reference that vandalism against Dessa by members of Copin. They don't reflect even a hint of the same serious concerns that David expressed to me after the fact. Less than two weeks before the murder, David and other Dessa officials were corresponding via group chat. One employee mentioned that the protesters aligned with Berta had damaged some Dessa property near the dam site. He suggested that the company highlight the damage and publicize pictures of it. David writes to the group, We have to take advantage of the evidence. Someone else chimes in. The damages are insignificant, but the information that we possess is convincing in order to crush them. A few minutes later, David writes, With a lot of strategy, this information has to explode. I spoke with David numerous times over the course of several months. The very first time I met him, in January of 2020, he was in a prison cell outside of Tegucigalpa. That day, he was ready for my visit. He pulled out a notebook. He'd written, in very small and neat handwriting, a detailed outline with bullet-pointed subheadings. These were notes of all the ideas he wanted to make sure to get across. For the first hour and a half or so, I'd ask a question, and he'd respond at length, consulting the outline and making his way through his notes. One of the headings in that outline concerned his relationship with Berta. He wanted to emphasize that he and Berta had genuine affection for each other. The public might assume an executive trying to build a dam and an environmentalist fighting against it wouldn't get along. There seems a perfectly natural antagonism there. But right from the start, he wanted to chip away at that assumption. You have to separate the idea that David Castillo, as a person, is DESA in the project, and that Berta Cáceres is Copin. David and Berta were really good friends. But the state tries to undermine this notion of friendship before the defense even gets a chance to make it. The state calls a woman named Rosalina Dominguez to the stand. She lives near the dam site by the Guacarque River. Rosalina was one of Berta's most loyal allies in that community. Ella, la, lo que ella decía, pues, que, ¿qué pensará David? Rosalina explains that Berta told her about threats she'd been receiving in the months before her murder. Text messages that she believed were related to her opposition to the dam. Rosalina is quoting Berta in a conversation she'd had with her shortly before her death. Quote, If something happens to me along the way, Berta had told her. It's David Castillo's fault. Es culpa de David Castillo. David's direct correspondence with Berta did seem friendly. He tells her in messages that he values her friendship, and her responses are often equally polite. But the prosecution reads other messages that David privately exchanged among colleagues in a group chat. These strike a different tone. In one, written less than two weeks before her murder, David writes, It's an opportune moment to expose Berta and Copine. She's said that our communication activities are the biggest cause of headaches for them. Someone responds, it's so great we're a pain in the butt of that woman. Ha ha. Someone else adds, In my opinion, we should publish photos of the car that she drives around in, photos of her house, and details about all sorts of luxuries she has, including that she has kids who are studying in Argentina. In summary, that she's getting rich at the cost of others. Some of the message strings that the experts read in court 
Texts exchanged directly between David and Berta don't seem that noteworthy at first. One is an exchange between the two of them where they're making arrangements to meet. Berta is visiting Tegucigalpa, where David lives. En el caso del día 7 de julio del 2015, a las 6.49... That's a state expert witness, reading messages between Berta and David. The expert is taking care to match each message to the exact geographic location of their telephones. She's establishing exactly where David and Berta were at the time of the exchanges. The expert an electronic forensics analyst named Brenda Barahona makes an interesting observation. Observation. When David Castillo wanted information about protest activities and Berta Cáceres' movements, he treated her cordially and referred to her as my esteemed. He would also show interest and availability to meet with her. Barahona reads some more exchanges to the court. In these, David tells Berta that he won't be able to meet her because he's traveling. But Barahona explains to the judges that cell phone tower data indicates that he wasn't telling her the truth. He was, in fact, in town. This leads the expert to offer some new insights. Observations. When Berta Cáceres proposed meeting with David Castillo and the meetings were not planned by him or were not in his interest, it is observed that David was unable to take part in such meetings, claiming to be outside of Tegucigalpa and in other occasions ill. Barahona says these messages cast the friendship between David and Berta in a different light. It could be concluded that his friendship with her is not sincere and that he simply uses it as a means to monitor and, in a way, to control Berta Cáceres. Brenda Barahona spends several days in the witness box. She walks the judges through a 400-page analysis of the telephone records. She says it exposes a plot to kill Berta. We've already discussed some of her findings in previous episodes, but during the trial, she reveals new details. Hello, That's a phone call between a man named Mariano Diaz and another named Henry Hernandez. Both of them are now in prison. Diaz was convicted for acting as a middleman between DESA employees and the hitmen hired to carry out the murder. Henry Hernandez was convicted for being the ringleader of the team of hitmen. Investigators had access to this conversation, which took place before Berta's murder, because Diaz's phone was being tapped as part of another unrelated investigation. So they were able to go back and listen to Henry tell Diaz Tengo el gatillero. I have the hitman. Prosecutors say that while Diaz is coordinating the hiring of the gunman with Henry, phone records show he's also in regular contact with Douglas Bustillo, Dessa's former head of security at the dam site. Hey, mira, ve que me vi con el Henry. This conversation takes place in January 2016, about seven weeks before the murder. Diaz is informing Bustillo that he spoke with Henry. In court, Barahona concludes that the three men are deep into the planning of Berta's assassination at this point. A text exchange between Bustillo and Diaz a week later, in mid-January, offers more detail. Bustillo, with DESA security, writes to Diaz, the middleman, I need the chispero. In Spanish, chispero is a word that usually refers to a small incendiary device, like a lighter or a sparkler. Prosecutors believe that in this case, Bustillo was talking about a gun. So Barahona says the men are planning a murder that will occur in early February. Bustillo meets with Henry Hernandez, 
Barahona discovered that during this encounter, Bustillo calls up several photos of Berta stored on his phone. And it's during this meeting, she says, that Bustillo gives Henry a gun. According to records from cell phone towers, Henry then travels to La Esperanza, where Berta lived. At the same time, Douglas Bustillo is in contact with David, a man he refers to in some messages simply as leader. This is the connection Barahona wants to highlight. She suggests David is using Bustillo to pull the strings of Berta's murder. The prosecutors explain that on the day of the planned murder, when Henry is in La Esperanza, David writes a message to Bustillo. David tells him to, quote, remember the accidents and the scene. Barahona says Henry Hernandez is monitoring Berta at this time, and he discovers that Berta isn't alone at her house. Henry writes to Diaz, informing him that there is, quote, bastante tráfico de gente, too many people around. Barahona says that's when this first attempt to assassinate Berta is abandoned. And the following morning, Henry Hernandez and Douglas Bustillo exchange seven telephone calls between them. Shortly after the last of those phone calls, Bustillo messages David. Mission aborted today. It wasn't possible today. I'll await for what you say because I don't have the logistics. I'm at zero. David responds, copy that. Mission aborted. A couple weeks later, Douglas Bustillo travels to La Esperanza. He stays there for three days. Barahona suggests that during this time, he secretly follows Berta. Using his phone, he takes photos of Berta walking on the street, for example. He goes to her subdivision, the place where she'd be killed about a week later, and takes pictures of the entrance. And then, on February 29th, three days before the murder, Bustillo again messages David. Barahona says they discuss payment and set up a meeting. The prosecutors say this is when David provided the funds to carry out the killing. mediante la información que le facilitaban respecto a Douglas Bustillo himself takes the stand and swears to tell nothing but the truth. But as prosecutors start to ask him questions, he doesn't tell them much at all. Prosecutors ask Bustillo to describe his relationship with David. Normal, he says. How about Berta? He never had any interactions with her, he says. The prosecutors asked him to explain those messages he sent to David before Berta's murder, the mission aborted messages. Bustillo doesn't seem to remember them. The only messages he recalls from that time, he says, had nothing to do with a murder. They were about a security job that David had asked him to do in a different part of Honduras. Bustillo doesn't give an inch. He leaves the stand and is driven back to prison, where he's already serving a 30-year sentence for his role in Berta's killing. None of the others who've already been imprisoned for Berta's murder are called to testify. But a statement from Mariano Diaz, the convicted middleman, is read out loud to the court. A special agent testifies that he took this statement from Diaz on the day of his arrest, back in 2016. In this statement, Diaz is proclaiming his innocence. But he says Douglas Bustillo had proposed to him the idea of killing Berta. Diaz says Bustillo offered him about $20,000 to help coordinate the assassination plan. Y que el dinero estaría siendo entregado por el, por el gerente de DESA. Diaz states to the police that Bustillo told him the money for the murder would come from DESA's director, una persona joven. 
a young person. That young person, according to prosecutors, is David Castillo, who became the CEO of DESA when he was still in his 20s. Brenda Barahona, the state's telephone expert, weaves all of this evidence together on the stand. And it's her testimony upon which the state's case rests. She's the one who made those observations about David and Berta's relationship earlier. She's the foundation of the case. As it happens, I'd been hearing Barahona's name for more than a year. David and his lawyers would bring it up in interviews with me and also with the local Honduran media on shows like La Entrevista. Brenda Barahona. Brenda Barahona. Brenda Barahona. To them, the name was a slur. They publicly complained that Barahona was biased against David. They accused her of twisting evidence, of taking messages out of context and purposefully manipulating them to implicate David. As the trial progresses, it's clear that the defense wants to put Brenda Barahona on trial. David's lawyers hired their own telephone experts from Mexico and the United States. Those experts, they say, used advanced technologies to extract messages that Brenda Barahona had somehow overlooked or suppressed. David had told me that this evidence, which would be revealed in detail in court, would destroy Barahona's credibility. When we saw her report, we noticed inconsistencies that we knew that were not true. And you will be surprised that we have found out more evidence that she has manipulated more phone calls and more phone data As the trial concludes, David's team will launch an all-out assault on the case that the prosecutors have assembled. We'll hear David's tearful plea to the judges, and we'll hear the verdict. That's next time on Blood River. Blood River is reported and written by me, Monty Real. Topher Forges is our senior producer. Our theme was composed and performed by Senya Rubinos. Special thanks to Carlos Rodriguez. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like what you hear, please leave us a review. It helps others find out about the show. Thanks for listening.